Welcome everybody to our uh, departmental seminar uh, of this week. We are honored to host uh, Dr. Amit Rice, um, who is from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Rice University in the United States. So thank you very much to wake up uh, very early this morning in the United States and being with us here in Israel. I mean, a uh, short uh, uh, bio uh, about um, Amit. Um, since August, he is a postdoctoral research associate at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering in Rice. And he's studying carbonate precipitation under reservoir conditions and its implication for CO2 storage and scale formation. Following, um, okay, he received his uh, BSc and master degrees, uh, both cum laude from the Department of Geological and Environmental Sciences at the Ben Gurion University. He then continued to a PhD supervised by Yves Harganor and Itai Gabrielli. The focus of his PhD <laughs> was uh, gypsum precipitation in hypersaline environments and its implication for the possible widening of the Dead Sea. He officially received his doctorate in March 2021. After the PhD, he started a postdoc at the Hebrew University with Simon Emanuel. In this role, he initiated a project in collaboration with Gabby Barnett from the NRCN to study the um, weathering mechanism and rates of, of cementitious matrices used to stabilize and store radioactive waste. He developed all the experimental procedures and wrote successful grants that ensure continued funding for this project in the upcoming years. Currently, Two students are continuing his work and he is remotely involved in supervising the project. In addition, he was involved in a, the project of uh, one of Simon's uh, master students to develop a new method to mineralize carbon. They submitted a patent and article uh, on that research. Um, while working on the cement we uh, weathering project, he thought it would be also interesting to observe fluid and radionuclide transport mechanisms through cement and quantify the dynamics of the transport process. He submitted a research proposal to the DAAD, which is uh, German-based uh, funding, and obtained a personal funding for a working visit at the Department of Reactive Transport of the Helmut Centrum Dresden Rosendorf in Germany. While in Germany, he worked alongside local scientists to develop an ex experimental protocol to apply positron emission tomography for in situ, in situ observation of the spatiotemporal distribution of radionuclides in different cement types. Currently, he is using the PET, the um, the system based method to, to observe and measure radionuclide diffusion in four different cement types used for radioactive waste uh, dispersion. This experiment will continue running until last um, three more months. Also, while in Germany, he received an offer from Professor Mason Thompson for his current postdoc position in Rice, which um, is the place where he is now residing. So uh, thank you very much, Amit. And today is going to talk about gypsum uh, precipitation under hypersaline conditions, implication for widening of the Dead Sea. So thank you very much, and the podium is yours. Okay, thank you very much for having me. Um, good afternoon, everybody, or if someone's on this side of the ocean, good morning. Um, I'll just say in advance that my kids are just about to be waking up for school, so I apologize in advance if there'll be any interruptions. Um, so I'm going to talk about my PhD. I study gypsum precipitation and hypersaline conditions, its implications for the possible whitening of the Red Sea Dead Sea project is ever built. And this was supervised by uh, Dr. Ivhar Ganor from the Geological Survey and, Dr. and Professor Ivhar Ganor from Ben Gurion University of the Negev. Um, wait, the slide doesn't... Oh, I have to use the mouse. Okay, just a few words in the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is a terminal hypersaline lake. It's oversaturated with respect to gypsum and mostly due to human intervention over the recent decades, it's been experiencing a negative water balance and you could see in the picture on the right here, 
um, the declining shores and also this causes different phenomena in and around the lake, like sinkholes. Um, so this is a very disturbed environment. And trying to work. Um, now there are plans or discussions between Jordan, the Hashemite Kingdom, between the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan and the government of Israel and some other international bodies to build a major desalination project known as the Red Sea Dead Sea project. Um, so basically during desalination, we take saline or brackish water, um, pump them through uh, membranes that are selective. They allow water to pass, but not ions or, or charged particles. And basically we get potable water and a concentrated reject brine that contains all the ions. And the idea behind the project is to discharge this reject brine into the Dead Sea. Um, the goals are to produce water well, water and hydroelectricity to reduce the negative water balance and to increase cooperation amongst the neighboring nations. Um, for some reason, when I click uh, on the keyboard, the screen doesn't continue. Um, I need to use the mouse, get used to it. Um, now, when we discharge seawater or reject brine into the Dead Sea, um, we basically start precipitating gypsum. I'll explain later why this happens. And it is feared that. Um, the gypsum precipitation would cause whitening of the lake. And when we say whitening, we mean increased turbidity to, of the surface area due to suspended crystals. Now, what would determine if the crystals would remain suspended and for how long is their size distribution and their morphology? So basically what would determine if there'll be a whitening event or not is a uh, microscopic processes of crystal formation. Now, when I talk about crystal formation, there are two distinct processes. The first one is nucleation, um, which is just the formation of the crystals via reaction uh, between the dissolved ions. Basically, there's a, a, a image here showing the process um, how as, as it's conceptualized by the classical observation. Um, basically, if I have an oversaturated solution, um, there's an energy to be gained by creating a, a solid phase. This happens through the creations of a uh, small nuclei of the forming crystal and due to interfacial tension, they're unstable. However, the specific size, um, they overcome the interfacial tension and become stable crystals. So this happens at a specific size. This is something that's important and I would address it again later on. The second process when we talk about precipitation is crystal growth. Once I have crystals in a system, it's thermodynamically favorable to grow them rather than to form new crystals. Um, so this is already a reaction between the formed solids and the aqueous phases. Um, one thing to take into mind to remember for the rest of the talk is if I measure the chemistry of the solution um, during a time that a surface of a, a new surface layer of the crystal grows, a larger crystal will take more ions. So if I measure the chemistry, I'll see a larger change. If I have a larger surface area of crystals, and this is also something I'll mention during the talk a few times. Um, now, the last definition to remember for the rest of the talk, if I look at a system that has, um, that's oversaturated, there's some time difference between the creation of the oversaturation until I could detect the creation of the crystals. During this time, uh, the, the system is dominated by nucleation. The crystals that form do grow, however, there's not a lot, a lot not a, there is not a lot of surface area available for growth, so I don't detect the change. The time where I could detect the change is called the induction time, and it is inversely proportional to the rate of nucleation. Um, basically, the faster the crystals are formed, the induction time will become shorter. It takes me less time to detect them. So. The idea to mix, um, to convey either seawater from either the Mediterranean or the Dead Sea or the Red Sea to the Dead Sea has been ex ex existed for decades. Um, so previous studies have looked at the thermodynamics of the mixtures and found out that it really increases the oversaturation and precipitation potential of uh, gypsum in the Red Dead Sea compared to today. And it was always assumed that the ratio of the rates of nucleation and crystal growth would determine if there'll be a whitening or not. Um, basically, the idea was that if we have fast nucleation and slow crystal growth, we'll have many small crystals that could remain in suspension and cause a whitening event. 
Um, so previous studies have also looked, studied the rates of nucleation and crystal growth. Um, and basically, we're, so these were well defined before I started my PhD. However, there were several key issues that were not addressed pr previously. Um, one thing no one beforehand looked at the effect brine composition has on the morphology. A morphology of a crystal or any solid has a small, has a large um, impact on its flotation ability. Um, no one looked at the crystal size distribution, which basically would determine how many small and large crystals they have, which de is dependent on the kinetics. Um, it was not studied how the precipitation of gypsum in brines, especially Dead Sea brines, impacts the turbidity, which basically when we talk about whitening, we talk about increased turbidity. And the last thing, no one really looked about how scale inhibitors impact the thermodynamics and kinetics of these processes and all these stories. Um, so basically, these are the four main keys I looked at during my PhD, and I would talk about them in this order. So this is kind of also the outline of the talk. So I'll start with the... Uh, with the morphology and size distribution of precipitating gypsum in hypersaline environments. Um, first of all, in the beginning of the talk, I said I would explain later on why it's expected that gypsum would precipitate. So if we look at this graph, it shows the oversaturation. Uh, someone has a microphone on. If you could please turn it off, <laughs> unless you have a question. Um, it shows the oversaturation as a function of a uh, percent dead sea in the mixture. So the X is a percent dead sea. So basically the right side of the graph is today's dead sea composition. And as we move to the left, we add seawater. And you could see there's an increase of uh, oversaturation until about 55% dead sea, which we obtain the same oversaturation as today, just with a lot of seawater inside. Um, so basically mixing increases a thermodynamic drive for gypsum precipitation and also chemical reactions are faster as we move further from equilibrium. So that would also accelerate the kinetics of gypsum precipitation. Another strong impact is the calcium to sulfate molar ratio. Basically the fastest kinetics is in a ratio of about one. Uh, the contemporary Dead Sea is over 130. The Red Sea is smaller than unity. So if we look again as a percent of Dead Sea as a, uh, the ratio of the calcium to sulfate, um, we see a small decrease. So again, this favors a much faster precipitation of the mineral. <clears throat> And basically, this is a basis to the thinking that massive amounts of gypsum would precipitate in the lake and cause a whitening. Um, now, each, each, each mixture I'll make between seawater and dead sea brine would have its own oversaturation and its own cal calcium to sulfate ratio. Um, and I wanted to know how each one of these parameters impacts um, the morphology and the kinetics and stuff like that. So what I did, I did different mixtures between red sea and dead sea. Um, brines, each one of them has their own their, their own um, composition and to each one I added calcium and sulfate in different amounts but in the same ratio as already in the initial brine. In this way I could basically create, um, have a constant calcium to sulfate ratio but different oversaturations. Um, I could also do it with other ratios between Dead Sea brine and Red Sea and get them um, varying calcium to sulfate ratio, but a constant oversaturation. So I could look how each one of these parameters impacts differently the system. Um, so I did many batches of these brines. I divided them into aliquots, put them in a thermostatic bath to control the temperature. And at designated times, I would just separate one bottle, take separate the crystals from the solution, do chemical analysis and look at the crystals. <clears throat> Um, and, and, and I did experiments under far from equilibrium um, conditions and closer to equilibrium conditions, um, changing the oversaturation. And one thing I saw is that far from equilibrium, um, the crystals have a, what's called a stellate or a spherulite morphology. Basically we have um, a radial center from which uh, crystals grow radially outward. And these crystals were seen in suspension. That means they can stay afloat in the brines. And closer to equilibrium, we get this very well-defined um, mediumorphic crystals. Um, so the degree of saturation has a very strong effect on the morphology of the crystals. And again, the ones, the spherulitic morphology 
I've seen in suspension in these experiments. Um, I also use a software named ImageJ um, to an analyze the uh, size of the crystal, their size distribution, different parameters of their shape. And if we take the aspect ratio of the crystals, which is their length to white as some uh, morphological criterion. So what we see is that when I move here from left to right with these images, I basically add more seawater to the Dead Sea and we see that there's an increase in the average aspect ratio. So basically the crystals become more and more elongated as the amount of seawater is added to the Dead Sea. Um, so another thing we could say is that at a given oversaturation, the morphology is affected by the composition of the brine or by the calcium to sulfate ratio. Um, I also, from the software, uh, deduce the size distribution of the crystals. You see here a duplicate of an experiment just to see I reproduce myself. And what we get is a lag normal size distribution. Um, there are very few, very large crystals. Um, if we look at the graph of the left type, um, this is a cumulative distribution of the size distribution um, during time from the same brine. So we see that the lag normal distribution um, keeps its shape over time. However, we get an increasing of the size of the average crystal. On the bottom, it's the average size of these three same experiments. And what we see is that we have a linear crystal size time relationship. Um, I also looked at specific single crystals growing from solution. There's one image here and also a single crystal shows a linear size with time um, growth pattern. And another thing, the aspect ratio of the crystals during this growth of a single crystal remains constant, which tells me that the ratio of growth rates of different faces is constant. Now, these observations I've showed you, it's all observations, no calculations or modeling. Um, are somewhat problematic um, and explain why. I already showed you this graph you see here of the, of the, the conceptualization of the theoretical or classical nucleation theory. And above it, I added the equation um, that gives the rate of nucleation according to the theory. Um, so basically the rate is, is proportional to E in the minus of different constants. Um, sigma to the third is an interfacial tension that for a single crystal, the gypsum in a single brine would also be constant. It doesn't change over time. The temperature, which is controlled in my experiment, so it's also a constant, and the natural logarithm of the oversaturation. Um, now, I've also shown you this um, graph you see here. And, and during the time where nucleation dominates the system, I also have the, there is no change in the chemical composition. That tells me that nucleation occurs dom dominantly under um, a fixed oversaturation. So if I look at the equation on the left, also the oversaturation would be constant. So this tells me that every delta T during the phase of nucleation, I create the same amount of crystals um, that they grow in the same solution. So they should grow in the same rate. And then I look at the size distribution and there is no mathematical way I could develop under the a constant growing oversaturation, this lag normal size distribution that has very few large crystals because um, they should be the first one that precipitated. So the conclusion of this is the classical nucleation theory does not describe what's happening when gypsum precipitates in the Red Sea Dead Sea project. Um, we're, not, we're not under the shame of this uh, classical accepted theory. So what we suggested during my first um, paper I wrote in the PhD um, was that the unstable nuclei that form um, go through agglomeration, which is combining of particles, and they could create uh, crystals um, by agglomerations that do not go through the critical size. By agglomeration, they could create crystals that are much larger from the critical size, and when they start crystal growth, they're already larger which would also explain why there are fewer of the large crystals. Now this has to happen at the early stages of precipitation because I showed you that the aspect ratio during growth of a crystal is constant and agglomeration would change that ratio. So this has to happen at this stage. Um, while this paper was in review, there was another paper published uh, actually in the same journal that they studied the internal structure of gypsum. And they found out that gypsum crystals often are mesocrystals. Now mesocrystals are crystals 
the diffract light as a single crystal. Um, they have defined uh, crystal faces, but they're built of uh, internal defined uh, different domains. And their conclusion was also that when the crystal was formed, it was through agglomeration of nanoparticles. So basically we have here two observations that were published around the same time. One looked at the microsystem induced outward, the second looked at the macrosystem deduced inward, and we both reached the same conclusion um, that agglomeration is a major part of uh, gypsum um, precipitation or nucleation. So we have new insights into the mechanisms of the crystal formation. Um, so I'll just sum up this part of the talk. Um, the classical nucleation theory does not explain the CSD formed in, of gypsum precipitation in these conditions. Uh, this is defined by the agglomeration and the morphology is determined by both brine composition and oversaturation. Um, so now I know how the crystal size distribution looks and, and how it develops over time. So I wanted to know how it impacts the turbidity, basically, would there be or not be a whitening? Um, so first of all, turbidity is just a measure for how clear a water is. It is affected by both the properties of the water body and of the solids in suspension. Um, the way to measure it is usually through light dispersion uh, and a turbidity meter or something. The units of this are nephalometric turbidity units. They have no physical properties. Um, turbidity is often used to monitor the quality of water in natural bodies, natural water bodies. It's also used in different industrial processes to understand what's going in different solutions. Um, so I set out to see how gypsum precipitation impacts the turbidity of Dead Sea brine mixed with different sea waters. Um, so I did multiple experiments under different conditions. I did a set of conditions experiments. You see here the, uh, in the greenish background and mixing ratios of 85, 70, and 55% Dead Sea. Um, these correlate to the maximum oversaturation, maximum precipitation potential, and a similar oversaturation to the current Dead Sea um, with different mixtures. And I did a set of experiments in the conditions where we saw earlier spherulitic experiments because I've seen these um, in suspension in the previous experiments. I also did a set of experiments at an oversaturation of three. Um, this specific oversaturation is important because if we look at the graph at the right that shows the uh, oversaturation as a function of uh, dead sea to reject brine mixtures, this is a maximum oversaturation it could get um, if I don't, if I exclude just by mixing. It means I exclude other processes that could concentrate the brine like evaporation that takes place in the natural system, but only by mixing this would be the maximum expected oversaturation we couldn't get. Um, I also did experiments closer to equilibrium, but their results were pretty much insignificant, so I'm not going to discuss them. And with these brines, I did two sets of experiments. One, um, I just put the brines inside a turbidity me meter and measured the, the development of turbidity over time. I called this spontaneous turbidity. And I also did a set of experiments where before every turbidity meter, I flipped the bottles to suspend all the crystals. So I basically measured what would be the turbidity if all the precipitate was, uh, was floating in solution and I called this potential turbidity. Um, so we could start by looking at the spontaneous turbidity. So we see here one experiment from the further from equilibrium conditions. Um, we could add some more experiments with higher and lower oversaturation. And if we look at the graph at the right, there's a dashed line there um, with 1.3 NTU. This is the lowest value of turbidity measured in a monitoring station in the Engedi coast. So I basically took it as a conservative criterion to increase turbidity where a person standing outside and looking into the lake um, would observe increased turbidity. And we could see that within a relatively short time, all the experiments pass this base of the Dead Sea turbidity. Um, we also see that in higher oversaturation, we reach, reach higher values of uh, turbidity and we see them faster. So basically the spherulitic morphology crystals can pass the turbidity of the base Dead Sea and potentially cause a whitening event. If we go to the experiment 
with an oversaturation of three that again, I said, this is the highest oversaturation that could be attained simply by mixing the brines without any additional processes. Over longer time periods, I don't see an increase in spontaneous turbidity. However, if we look at the potential turbidity within this time frame, it does surpass the base value. This tells me that at the maximum expected oversaturation, uh, again, excluding other processes that could concentrate the brine, um, even when sufficient amounts of gypsum have precipitated to cause increased turbidity in the Dead Sea, um, it doesn't happen spontaneously. Um, we could add uh, experiments also from different ratios of Dead Sea seawater with the same oversaturation, and it's pretty much throughout the mixing ratios in which um, gypsum precipitates, we see the same thing. So at this oversaturation, we do not expect to see a whitening event. Um, now, if you look at the potential turbidity, so over time, there's a, it kind of levels off. This is because experiments um, get closer to equilibrium, gypsum starts precipitating, so we reach some, some maximum value. So we could just look what happens at the maximum value or when we obtain the potential, when we basically extract, uh, got to the maximum potential of uh, precipitation, the most gypsum that will precipitate. Um, and we basically see that there's a relationship between um, between the measured turbidity, which is a y-axis and the precipitate. Um, okay, so, and this is fine because we know how to precipitate, to calculate the potential uh, precipitation. We know how much would precipitate, so this correlation is nice. Um, Another observation from these experiments, I said when I started talking about the subject, is that many, uh, the turbidity is used to monitor natural environments. Oftentimes people try to make correlations between the amount of suspended matter and the turbidity, because then you could use turbidity just to monitor and know what's inside your brine. What we see here when it's an orthogenic process, that even if you have a single chemical component, um, well, while there is a linear relationship, each one depending on the crystals size distribution that precipitate and the kinetics of the single experiment have a different linear relationship. So I don't have a unique relationship between the amount of gypsum and turbidity. Um, and this is something that should be considered um, when we try to correlate between, uh, turbidity to the amount of suspended solids or other things that interest us in the water. Um, Another thing we see here, there's a negative intercept. It appears that not all of the gypsum um, contributes to the whitening or to the turbidity. I'll explain why in the next slide. Um, basically, these two graphs shows um, a measurement of potential turbidity at a certain time during an experiment. Um, in the left one, you could see I just, uh, 355 minutes within an experiment, I kind of suspended all the crystals. You could see a very quick decline in the turbidity. And the white graph of the turbidity is just measured, is just normalized to the maximum turbidity. So we could see again, we have a very, very quick um, relaxation of turbidity once um, after suspending the crystals. So they don't stay in suspension. And this also may explain the negative intercept we saw before. Basically, the, so there's a few very large crystals settle out of solution quickly um, and don't contribute much to the turbidity. So all of the experiments we've seen so far suggest that a whitening event is not um, likely to happen. However, we should consider that the natural, that laboratory experiments are not the natural system. Um, in the experiments, I have a single event of uh, mixing. Basically, I immediately mix it the two end members. Whereas if I discharge rigid brine into the lake or seawater, um, close to where the brine comes in, I'll have the composition of what's flowing in. Far away, the lake won't even know that something entered. And in between, I'll have uh, this gradient of concentration and only one place in space and time would have the, the concentration or the chemical composition of the experiment. Another thing is just a matter of scale. Uh, the photic zone in the lake where crystals in suspension can contribute to a whitening event is about nine meters. Whereas the vials of the experiment are several centimeters, so if we correlate the, <coughs> excuse me, if we correlate the times for the crystals to clear from solution, so an hour or so in an experiment would equal um, a week or longer in the lake. 
<clears throat> again, and there's also additional factors um, to consider in the lake. We have winds, waves, stuff like that that I don't have in my experiments. I have temperature changes on a daily and um, seasonal time scales. Um, I don't have scale inhibitors, which is the next thing I'm going to talk about. And of course, there are other unknown factors I might have not taken into consideration. Um, so basically, we, while it appears it would not be a whitening event, we should be cautious when trying to be certain about what would happen in the natural environment. So just to sum up this part, um, the spontaneous development and relaxation of turbidity is very rapid. At the maximum expected oversaturation in the Dead Sea, um, we don't see turbidity that surpasses what's naturally in the lake on clear days. Um, there is no one-to-one -one relationship between suspended solids and turbidity. <clears throat> Gypsum that is physically suspended settles out of solution very quickly if we stop suspending it. And laboratory scale experiments suggest that whitening of the Dead Sea is not likely. However, again, we should be cautious when we make such predictions to the natural system. Um, and the last part of my PhD I'm going to talk about today is how scale inhibitors impact this. Um, this part of the talk would be somewhat more mechanistically chemical than the rest. Um, basically during desalination, as well as other industrial processes, uh, brines become oversaturated, precipitate minerals, which cause scale that could clog pipes, membranes, etc. You could see the picture on the left, those are um, pipes from the CO desalination plant in the Negev full of gypsum scale. And basically to prevent such processes, um, um, scale inhibitors are added to, to different processes. Um, the most common type of scale inhibitors in seawater desalination are phosphonates, um, which can react either with the nuclei and prevent its formation into a stable crystal, or it can sorb onto crystals and prevent their further growth. Um, their efficiency depends on the concentration of the inhibitor, the oversaturation of the brine to the mineral we want to retard and to the pH. Um, though this is not the issue of the TAC, um, I would also want to mention they're also in, related to some environmental issues. Um, recent, uh, recent studies showed that the microorganism can cleave the phosphorus carbon bonds in the phosphonates and utilize scale inhibitors as a um, as nutrients, and if we're planning to discharge seawater and dilute the Dead Sea and also supply these nutrients into the lake, we might cause eutrophication or other things. So it's something to consider, though I'm not going to discuss it um, right now. Um, so I wanted to know first if scale inhibitors at all work under these hypersaline conditions. They're not designed to work in those conditions. And if so, what, what are the mechanisms and how they react with the forming gypsum? So just some general numbers. Um, the suggested project, at least the pilot stage of the Red Sea Dead Sea um, project calls for taking 300 million cubic meters of water from the Red Sea annually, um, desalinating it to produce 65 million cubic meters of uh, potable water. And the ultimate rigid brine, if we take these numbers, would be a brine that's concentrated in a factor of one times 28, that of seawater. And that's what would be eventually discharged into the Dead Sea if the project is ever built. Um, so to prepare brine similar to what would be discharged into the Dead Sea, I went to the Solic desalination plant. I sampled seawater being pumped into the plant before the scale inhibitors were added or before any chemical treatment. And I also um, sampled the rigid brine being discharged out of the plant. I brought these to the lab. Um, the rejig brine I diluted with seawater to bring it to the concentration of, uh, of 1.18 watts in seawater. So I basically have a, a brine similar to what would be discharged into the Dead Sea that contains a scale inhibitor. I also evaporated seawater to the same concentration. So I have these two brines with the same that are chemically identical. Only one of them contains a scale inhibitor and the other does not. Um, and they're both similar to the chemical composition of what would be discharged into the Dead Sea if the project is ever built. Um, I did different experiments where I mixed these um, brines with different amounts of uh, Dead Sea brine. And I did two sets of experiments. One of them, I just put the brines inside uh, 
pyrex bottles as a reaction cell and measured sulfate over time. And these bottles have nucleation and crystal growth. And I also did sets of experiments where I added the brines to bottles that were preceded with gypsum. And as I said earlier, if I have crystals in solution, it's thermodynamically favorable to grow them and not form new ones. So I basically forced the system to have only crystal growth so I could look at the processes separately. Um, I also separated the crystals from solution at the end of the experiment um, where I had nucleation pl plus growth. And we see here crystals from uh, two experiments. On the right and the left with our red background, it's crystals that precipitated within brine's with scale inhibitors on the right without. The two top ones have the same chemistry. The two bottom ones have the same chemistry. And what we see is that the presence of scale inhibitors um, creates fewer crystals and larger crystals. So from the point of view of whitening, this is an excellent, because if I have fewer crystals, it could contribute to turbidity and they're larger, they sink faster out of the water column. It even lowers the possibility of a whitening event. Um, however, I was interested in how this works mechanistically. Um, so if we look at uh, experiments within the seeded ones, so here I have only crystal growth, and it appears that the rate of crystal growth is impervious to the presence of scale inhibitors. However, if I look at the same chemical compositions, we have nucleation and growth. We see in the red dots that I have a much extended induction time, the time until I could observe a change in the system. And after the induction time, the change in sulfate with time um, with the scale inhibitor is slower. So they both in so the presence of the inhibitors impacts the nucleation and it, the overall rate of precipitation. Um, so how does this work? So I basically said there are three parameters that uh, influence the efficiency of the scale inhibitors, the oversaturation, the pH, and the concentration of the inhibitor. Now the variation of my pH in these experiments is negligible, so I won't discuss it. Um, if we look at the induction times as a function of oversaturation in the experiments, we could also extend the smaller part. And we see there's a, an inverse relationship between the two. It means uh, the more oversaturated I am it, with or without scale inhibitor, I have a faster induction time. Um, but we also see that over the entire range of the experiments, uh, the scale inhibitors extend the induction time. Um, so to try and quantify it, um, we could look at what's called a retardation factor, which is a uh, induction time with a scale inhibitor to the induction time without. Basically, if with no scale inhibitor, I have an induction time of one day, and the addition of the in inhibitor extends this to two days, I'll have a retardation factor of two. And when we compare the retardation factor to the oversaturation, we see that there is no correlation between them. Um, so basically, the, the oversaturation here is not something that explains what's going on. Now, the concentration of the scale inhibitors, which is the last parameter, um, changes in each of the experiments because that comes from the fraction that's non-dead C. So the more I add of the rigid brine, I have a higher concentration of scale inhibitor. Um, right. So it could also normalize the retardation factor to the concentration of the scale inhibitor. I call this normalized retardation factor. And when we look at it, we see that the two experiments that have the most dead sea water, that means the less uh, scale inhibitor, and the experiment that has the less less amount of dead sea water, that means the most scale inhibitor, have a normalized retardation factors. So basically also the, the concentration of the inhibitor does not allow me to predict the inhibition of gypsum precipitation in the Dead Sea Red Sea project. Um, so the three parameters I said that are found in the literature is what impacts um, the efficiency of the scale inhibitors, the pH, the oversaturation, the concentration of the scale inhibitor um, don't, don't explain what's happening in the system. Um, so we're really getting towards the end of the talk. Um, the last thing I did was try to model it to try and understand what happened. We just have here a general rate law um, from any physical chemistry course where the rate mole to time change of the system is a function of some uh, rate coefficient, which takes into account the composition temperature, ETC, a uh, function of the surface area. I, I told you in the beginning of the talk that if I measure the change of uh, concentration of the brine, the more surface area I have at a given the growth rate, um, I'll see a faster 
change in time on a function of uh, the distance from equilibrium. Basically, chemical uh, reactions are faster the further we move from equilibrium. Um, so in the experiments with the with the seated experiments where I added we added gypsum, I know the function of the surface area. I basically created it and added it. I know the function of the oversaturation. And unsurprisingly, the experiments it seems that are not impacted by the scale inhibitor give me that the rate of crystal growth, which is basically the rate coefficient, um, does not depend on the concentration of the scale inhibitor. And then if we look at the experiments where I did not add seed, seeded experiments, where I had nucleation and growth, so now I know what the coefficient is, because it's the same coefficient for the other experiments, and basically looking at the same chemistry. Um, this time I don't know what the function of the surface area is because the surface area is what's created during nucleation, not something I can control. So I run the model again. This time the, fun the surface area was a free parameter and you could see the nice fit of the model to the experimental results. So this basically tells me that the surface area that's created during nucleation um, is what determines the overall precipitation rate of gypsum in these conditions. Um, so just to verify the results of the model, right? just to verify the results of the model, we could look at the specific surface area without scale inhibitor to the one with scale inhibitor. Um, these are basically the same experiments. So, so at each oversaturation I look, it's basically, I have the same amount of precipitate mass. So the specific surface area would give me the ratios of surface areas. And if we compare these to the, so I also com computed them from the model, the RSSA from the models is the squares. I also uh, measured them from images where it was possible when I had enough crystal surfaces, the triangles, and we see that the specific surface area um, really sits well with the retardation factor. So the conclusion of all of this is that the scale inhibitors, what they do, they interact with the nuclei during the nucleation. Um, probably some game on the interfacial tension. They force the creation of larger crystals. And then we have fewer, uh, smaller surface area available for growth. So basically, this is what determines the overall precipitation rate of gypsum in these mixtures. So just to conclude this part of the talk, so the anti do work under the hypersaline conditions of the RSDSP. Um, they impact the induction time and through game through affecting the specific surface area created during the nucleation. Um, they do not impact the crystal growth rate. And one thing we did see is that the addition of scale inhibitors um, creates fewer larger crystals that for a whitening event potential is great. However, as I mentioned earlier, we should also consider they have uh, um, possible implications for the biota in the lake once we start adding seawater inside and lowering the salinity. And some conclusions of the attack overall, so gypsum nucleation does not follow the classical path. Uh, scale inhibitors retard gypsum under the conditions of the Red Sea Dead Sea project, and they reduce the likelihood of a whitening event. Uh, the dynamics of turbidity we saw also suggests that there would not be a whitening event. However, again, we should be cautious because not small scale natural small scale laboratory experiments are not the natural system. And the oversaturation of morphology of gypsum is what we want to monitor if there's a pilot stage, since eventually from what we said that, that those are the factors that would determine whether a whitening event would develop or not. Um, that's it, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Amit. It was really enlightening, um, your PhD uh, project, so congrats. I am opening the podium for questions from the audience. Maybe they're shy. Oh, maybe they're shy. Maybe everything was clear and there's no questions. <laughs> well, I can ask you something. Can you apply your project to, um, to let's say, the Mycenaean, the gypsum from the Mycenaean salinity crisis? Well, um, 
Yeah, yes and no. When you, the question, when you say apply it to what, what are you looking to see in the Messinian salinity crisis? Well, I don't know, the insight that you got from the Dead Sea. Um, uh, probably not too much. I mean, if you try to deduce the conditions on which the gypsum grow, maybe the insights into the kinetics um, and the mechanisms might help you deduce backwards, but um, I'm not really sure. I mean, something you should think about. <laughs> okay. No okay. Yeah. Um, somebody else? Very quiet, the audience today. <laughs> Maybe okay. everything was very clear. Or not at all, but <laughs> that's another option. Okay, well, thank you very much for having well, me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, here we have comments. Very nice talk in the chat. Um, okay. okay. This is a great talk. A small desalination project search for brine disposal. Okay. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Amit. And I okay. hope that we will host you personally in Haifa soon. Well, maybe in a few years, I have some interesting stuff from my postdoc and <laughs> we could be in touch back then. Excellent. Yeah. Great. Right, well, Thank you very much, then. Yeah, here the sun's coming out, so it's time to start the day. <laughs> Excellent. Take another yeah. coffee. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, definitely need it. All right. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Uh...